Welcome to Alive. <laughs> so glad you're here. We're studying the book of Isaiah, and uh, the section for today has to do with judgment. The judge of the universe. We know our Heavenly Father by many names, of course. He's the Creator, He's the Lord, He's our Father. He's also judge. And in Isaiah's early chapters, uh, a great deal of space is devoted to God as the judge of the nations. Remember that the early part of the book of Isaiah is all about judgment. First 39 chapters of the 66 are about judgment. And then the emphasis shifts to comfort, restoration, and God's plans for the future. But these early chapters are heavy chapters that deal with God's righteous judgment. He will judge the nations, Isaiah said. And in fact, he's already begun. Uh, may help to just get a little geography in our mind. We, we don't think about geography a lot, do we? Um, unless you're on Facebook and somebody says, how many states have you been in? We might start to think about it. 37 for me. Anybody beat 37 states? Carol has? Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's more to geography than Facebook, though. And someone has said to know what happened, it helps to know where it happened. Because history and geography go together. And they're mutual influences on each other. I may have told you this before. I love this story. You know that Michael Jordan majored in geography when he was at UNC? And when he graduated, the head of the geography department put out uh, an ad that said, consider geography for a major. Last year's starting, uh, average starting salary for our geography majors, $250,000. You should consider geography as a major. Well, geography is important. Um, and it helps us understand what Isaiah was talking about when he said God's going to judge the nation around Judah. Judah is in the Fertile Crescent, which is a, a stretch of, of uh, very rich farmland that, that runs from Egypt on its uh, southwestern end all the way to the Persian Gulf on its southeastern end. It's called fertile because it's such great farmland. It's fed by rivers, the major rivers of the Middle East. And it's called a crescent because that's its shape. It's half moon shaped. It, it's shaped that way because it stretches around the desert where the rivers don't run, where nothing grows. And so this fertile crescent became home and highway to the nations of the Middle East. That's where they lived and that's also the way that they traveled. So to go from east to west, you didn't just go as the crow flies. The crow wouldn't make it across the desert. You go around the Fertile Crescent, you follow the water. And that's where the roads were. Well, what's true for travelers is also true for armies. And so when armies are on the march, that's the route they take. And to control those roads is militarily important. And so that's why even small nations like Israel and Judah are on the menu for the larger nations. It's important that they control those highways and so the, uh, they always target those nations along the Fertile Crescent. Israel and Judah were on the southern end of the Fertile Crescent and that made them targets. In the early chapters of his prophecy then, Isaiah quotes God as having a lot to say about foreign nations targeting his people. Uh, this section is often called the oracles against the nations. Oracle is just another word for prophecy in this case. And so it's a roll call, basically, of Israel's enemies and Judah's enemies. Um, and, and, and God is serving notice on them that judgment lies ahead for everyone. We're not surprised to see Assyria on that list. 
in the early chapters of Isaiah. Assyria was the bully of the age. Assyria was the dominant power during Isaiah's day. They were building an empire. The nations, the other nations of the Middle East were grist for the mill as far as they were concerned. No nation was a match for Assyria. That's absolutely true. But Assyria was no match for God. That's Isaiah's message. And he said, the yoke of Assyria will be lifted from Judah and shattered. And it was during Isaiah's lifetime. But these chapters don't just deal with Assyria. They deal with other nations as well. Oracles of the Nations goes on to talk about Phoenicia or modern Lebanon, uh, Philistia, uh, the, the land of the Philistines in um, uh, uh, Jewish history all through the Old Testament. The Egyptians, of course, remember their uh, sordid history with the people of God. The Edomites, the Moabites, the um, uh, Arabians, the Ethiopians. There's a long list of nations. God, uh, Isaiah says God's going to deal with them. And Babylon. Babylon had to be the most surprising name on the list for Isaiah's contemporaries because in his day Babylon was not a threat to anybody. Babylon was on nobody's radar screen. They were under the thumb of Assyria. They were the nation closest to Assyria on that southern end and uh, nobody worried about Babylon because they weren't even sure that Babylon could survive the domination of Assyria. But Isaiah knew better. Isaiah knew from the Lord that the day would come when not Assyria but Babylon would be the greatest threat that Judah would ever face. And so in chapters 13 and 14 and again in chapter 21, Isaiah devotes a lot of space to God's message to Babylon. Uh, here's what he says in chapter 13. Babylon's going to become a ghost town. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride. And remember, all of this is prophetic. It wasn't true at the time Isaiah wrote it. There was no glory in Babylon, but he knew it was coming. That glory will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived through in all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will be there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell. And there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in her strongholds. And that's exactly what happened. Long after Isaiah had lived and died, Babylon came to power. Babylon defeated Assyria. Babylon began to dominate the world the way Assyria had. Babylon targeted Judah and took her captive. But after the fall of Babylon in 539, and that's recorded in the book of Daniel, we'll get to that more in, uh, later in this passage in Isaiah, the city never rose again. It did become a ghost town. Now the the nation of Babylonia is modern Iraq, but the city of Babylon that was its capital, the grandest city of the world in its day, is just a ruin now. And it has been since biblical times. What did Isaiah said, say? It's going to be inhabited by jackals and hyenas. Uh, Saddam Hussein decided that he would rebuild the city of Babylon. And it would be kind of like his version of Colonial Williamsburg. It would be a restoration of all the glory of Babylon because he thought that would reflect well on him and on Iraq. Where is Saddam today? And where is his plan for rebuilding Babylon? It's a ruin and not even uh, the, the uh, historical tourist industry visits Babylon and they visit all sorts of ruins all through the Middle East and the Mediterranean area, but not Babylon. God's promise came true. It's a ghost town. In chapter 14, Isaiah records a taunt against the king of Babylon. Uh, a taunt is like trash talk in a, in a sports arena. Um, God is insulting the king of Assyria. Uh, 
I'm sorry, king of Babylon. And what he says in that chapter is uh, the king will try to establish his throne in the heavens. He'll try to compete with God. But he will be cast down out of heaven. Does that sound familiar? Because Jesus used those same words about Satan later in the New Testament. Chapter 21 is where our text begins today. And it continues the words of uh, prophecy from Isaiah against Babylon. Chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. A prophecy against the desert by the sea. Like whirlwinds sweeping through the Southland, an invader comes from the desert from a land of terror. A dire vision has been shown to me. The traitor betrays. The looter takes loot. Elam, attack. Media, lay siege. I will bring an end to all the groaning she, Babylon, has caused. A desert by the sea. That's a paradox. Because if you're by a sea, you're not a desert, typically, right? Uh, 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 the, the desert area is a desert because of the absence of, of fresh water. And yet here is, uh, is Babylon that has flourished because it's in that fertile crescent fed by the rivers. Uh, the river Euphrates ran through the middle of the city of Babylon. Under the city walls, the main street in Babylon was, was like Venice. It's traversed by boats and not, not by uh, carts and foot traffic. Uh, the Euphrates ran through the city, providing fresh water. There were canals everywhere off the uh, Euphrates to, to uh, provide water for the farmland. And then just a few miles away was the Persian Gulf itself. There is... There is uh, there's no reason to call it a desert by the sea. It are, it's near the desert, but Babylon itself was very fertile. God called it a desert because he said that's what it's going to be when I destroy it. It's going to be as desolate and forsaken as the desert areas around it. It's going to be home for jackals and hyenas, as he said before. Listen to that verse 5. They set the tables, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink. Get up, you officers, oil the shields. Now remember, Isaiah's prophesying about the future when, when the third-rate Babylon of his day is going to become the world ruler. And he says, that Babylon's going to fall when they set the tables, spread the rugs, eat and drink. Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, throws a feast. And to insult the God of Israel, he brings the vessels from the temple into his palace and uses them, instead of his own vessels, uses them for a night of feasting and rioting. Uh, riotous behavior. Drunkenness, profanity, um, all sorts of, of a godless behavior fueled by the alcohol drunk from the gold and silver plated vessels from God's temple. That's Belshazzar's idea of an insult. But you remember how chapter 5 continues? In the middle of all this revelry he sees a disembodied hand writing on the wall. And it says, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is required of you. And then the next verse in Daniel, after Daniel translates that for Belshazzar, the next verse says, that night was Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, slain. What happened that night was that the Persians, that included allies from Elam and Media, who are mentioned in this verse in Isaiah, the Persians infiltrated the defenses of Babylon during the riotous behavior at that banquet when everybody was in his cups. Uh, they sent a, 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 a pre-modern uh, era version of Navy SEALs under the walls of the city uh, by swimming the Euphrates. And they came up on the other side to find the city unguarded and they opened the gates 
the army poured in, Babylon fell in a night. A night when the tables were set, the rugs were spread, and they were eating and drinking. This is one of those incredible prophecies from Isaiah that is detailed in its accuracy about the way that God is going to judge Babylon. Uh, these oracles against the nations are a reminder to us that God is not watching idly by, but he is active in our world. He is at work still among us, and not just waiting for judgment day, but God is influencing events in our world even now. One of the primary forms of religion in um, John Wesley's day was called deism. And deism started off by saying there is a God, but then they continued by saying, but he has nothing to do with this world. He's not interested in it. He created it and then left it alone. Uh, he created it to run by natural order, you know, the laws of nature, and then God's busy somewhere else. He has nothing to do with this world. That's far from true. God is intimately involved in the world that he created and the uh, fall of Babylon is evidence of that. Still in our lesson in chapter 21, verse 9 says, look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses and he gives back the answer, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. Now, if that verse sounds familiar, it may be because John reports in the book of Revelation that someone has shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Revelation echoes the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, John wrote that hundreds of years after the fall of Babylon. So why was it news in John's day that Babylon has fallen or in John's prediction of the future that Babylon has fallen? Because Babylon had become, by John's day, a symbol. It was a symbol of all the ungodly nations of the world. Babylon was a symbol of Satan's ungodly rule in the world that would fall before God in the last days. And isn't it interesting that that imagery of Babylon was resurrected to say Rome, the new Babylon, cannot stand before God. No new Babylon can stand before God. The Nazi powers in World War II couldn't stand before God. Do you think God influenced the outcome of World War II? I do. I'm convinced that he did. Do you think God had a hand in the, the fall of communism in the 1980s? I think he did. I believe God is still judging the nations and, and working righteousness for his people. Uh, I have no idea what the future is going to hold. I don't know who the next enemies of peace will be. There are a lot of candidates out there. But I do know that God is in control, and Isaiah's message is his plans will prevail on the world scene. Um, sometimes people think that, that Christians are just too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. <laughs> but, but we're called to make a difference in this world, and the and the example that we follow is the example of God himself because he makes a difference in this world. God is not just waiting to the end to say, well, you'll all get it then. But his hand is in world affairs as situations develop, as nations rise and fall. I'm not saying everything that happens is a direct result of the action of God. But I'm saying the broad sweep of history is still under God's control and he chooses to exert his influence. So part of the message in this chapter in Isaiah is God's going to judge the nations. But part of it is God's going to judge his own people 
it's clear that God has been taking names and he is settling accounts with these nations. The nations I named to you a while ago circle Israel and Judah. Uh, now the Mediterranean Sea is on their west, but the north and the east and the south, that's where those enemy nations came from. So they were just surrounding God's people. And God said, I'm going to bring judgment on them. But then he also said, I'm going to judge my people for their sin too. Being the people of God is not an exemption from the responsibility to be obedient to God and to follow God's direction. Uh, you may recall a few weeks ago we started our study, 1st of December, with Isaiah chapter 1, a chapter that Bible scholars have called the Great Arraignment, where God calls people into court and says, I'm, I'm uh, calling uh, witnesses against you. Heaven and earth will be the witnesses against you that you've broken the covenant. That was God's people. That's not Assyria. It's not Babylon. It's not any of those other nations. That's Judah. And God said, I'm going to judge your sin as well. That's why Judah went into captivity in Babylon. It was God's judgment on their sin at the time. God will judge sin wherever he finds it, including among his own people. I can't forget what Ruth Graham said one time, Billy Graham's wife. She said, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. God judges sin. His people are supposed to be far from it. But when they're not, and I'm not saying America is God's nation. God's the God of the whole world. God's people cover the globe. They're not just here on our shores. But I am saying that we have had a history of acknowledging God's supremacy among us. And that history is fading fast. Uh, I'm not speaking in political terms. God's not a Republican. God's not a Democrat. God is God. And he has standards that we're ignoring. Uh, uh, not political disagreements, but moral failure is what God will judge. He will judge us too. Now, this whole section is not about Judgment Day. On Judgment Day, we'll stand before the great white throne of God and each individual will give an account of the life that we have lived. No, not really the life that we have lived, of our relationship to the Lord that has determined the outcome of the life that we live. Because it's not our works and it's not in our efforts, but it's in His grace that salvation lies. Hebrews 9.27, where it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Romans 14.10, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. But don't get burdened by those verses without also reading Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When we stand before the judgment bar of God, he doesn't see us. He sees the blood that covers us. And the salvation that we enjoy is not of our doing. It's the gift of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Our sin is real, but it's been judged already if we are under the blood. It was judged on the cross. Well, there's one more verse in our lesson today, and it's a little out of place, I think. It's, it's Isaiah 2.4. It's about judgment, but it's not about the same kind of judgment. So I want to close with this instead of beginning with it. Isaiah 2.4, He will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. The verse so nice the Bible quotes it twice because this is also almost word for word in Micah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4 have the same verse in them. Now we don't know who originated the verse and who borrowed 
the verse, but this is in a day before there was any such thing as plagiarism, and so the intent was not to pretend authorship of something that the other didn't write. This is actually a compliment in saying, I, it's been said better than I can say it. Either Isaiah quoted Micah or Micah quoted Isaiah. They were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. But this is a famous verse, isn't it? If you go to New York on peace the Plaza of Peace across from the United Nations. It's carved on a wall. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. There is a statue at the United Nations. Curiously enough, paid for by Russia. There is a statue at the United Nations of a man beating his swords into plowshares. This is the universal desire for peace. This is the cry of the human heart for peace. And God says, the day is coming when I won't have to judge sin anymore. The day is coming when my judgment, in quotes, can be the simple settlement of honest disputes between nations. Where should the boundary be? It should be here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Instead of people going to war over this. Um, uh, you know that, that being right with God doesn't mean that we're right about everything else. And you and I might disagree on something. We might need somebody to help us settle a dispute. But what the attitude of the heart is, is the key in that matter. And so God here is being a judge kind of like in the book of Judges earlier in the Old Testament. He is not bringing them to a judgment of destruction he is bringing a judgment like a mediator or an arbitrator to settle disputes, keyword peacefully. Because there is coming a day of peace. The millennium is a righteous reign of peace that leads to eternity and peace with God. In the 1950s, there was a Jewish rabbi named Joshua Liebman who wrote a bestseller. It was called Peace of Mind. And it introduced many people to psychoanalysis. It was a bestseller, New York Times bestseller list for a long time. Billy Graham read that book. And then he wrote his own book. It wasn't called Peace of Mind. It was called Peace with God. It became a bigger bestseller. It had better answers. We are looking for peace. And peace doesn't originate with you or with me, it originates with God and our willingness to let him rule in our lives. One day, Isaiah 2.4 says, nations won't be stockpiling weapons, nuclear or other. One day, there won't be war. There will be universal peace. Yeah. 1945, Carol, I'm glad you and Don are here today. 1945, John Frank Childs passed away. John Frank Childs was the president of what's now Southern Wesleyan University, one of its best presidents ever. Greatly loved. He had helped lead the college through the Depression. He had helped lead the college through the Second World War. He was a member of this church when it was located on the campus. And he's Carol's uncle. He was a hero in the history of the university. And I've been thinking of him this week because I was thinking about his last words. When he was on his deathbed, John Frank Childs said, I plead the mercy of the court. There's the judgment bar of God idea. I plead the mercy of the court and the blood of the lamb. So do we all. So do we all. Let's pray together. Lord, we long for peace. We long for world peace. We long for inner peace. We long for your peace. We thank you for the promise of it, both now in our relationship with you and eventually for the whole world. May we be true to you so that 
we don't have to be one of those nations on whom you bring judgment. That we don't have to be the people who experience the judgment of God in a negative sense. But that we can hear on that great day of judgment, welcome home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's our prayer. By your grace and with your help, may we live that spirit now. In Christ's name, amen.